Hi, this is Dr. Perry Carpenter. I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join me on this week's video. On this week's video, we're in session number five of our new and ongoing series entitled Orthopedic Essentials for the Qualified Medical Evaluator. And in this series, we're focusing on an interesting topic which has to do with the nature of true positive physical examination findings. True positive physical examination findings. And part of the necessity for a program like this has to do with some disturbing findings from a recent 2017 study published by the WCIRB, which is the Workers' Compensation Institute Review Board. And this 2017 study contains the most recent statistics that we have regarding the state of the workers' compensation system here in California. And according to the WCIRB, California leads the nation, or perhaps I should say trails the nation, in the rate at which injured worker examinees go on to receive a permanent impairment rating once their condition reaches maximum medical improvement. So let me say that again with some different words. In California, a high preponderance of examinees, which are injured workers who are evaluated by us, by qualified medical evaluators, a high percentage, the highest percentage in the entire nation, go on to receive permanent impairment ratings. In other words, California ranks 50th out of 50 states in examinees who fail to recover to a pre-injury status. California leads the nation, in other words, ranks one out of 50, in the number of examinees who fail to recover to pre-injury status and therefore go on to receive a permanent impairment rating from the qualified medical evaluator. Now, an interesting question to ponder has to do with why. Why is California doing so poorly in uh, returning injured workers to a pre-injury condition? Why is California doing so poorly in uh, providing permanent impairment ratings for so many examinees? Is it because the severity of injuries in California is much more severe than in other states? Are the severity of industrial injuries in California much more severe and more devastating than injuries in Oklahoma? <laughs> I suspect it has nothing to do with the severity of injuries. What about medical care? Is medical care for industrial injuries in California somehow deficient and poorer and less competent than medical care for industrial injuries in Louisiana, for example? I don't think it has to do with the quality of medical care either. Really, the problem stems from a lack of understanding from qualified medical evaluators as to what constitutes true positive physical examination findings. Now, the AMA guides tell us on page two, and I have my AMA guides right here, it says on page two that an, an impairment can be manifested objectively for example, by a fracture and or subjectively through fatigue and pain. It says, although the guides emphasize objective assessment, subjective symptoms are included within the diagnostic criteria. So the AMA guides themselves emphasize true positive objective physical examination findings. So we're taking the time to focus in this program on what constitutes true positive physical examination findings, findings that do actually qualify for permanent impairment ratings in chapters 15, 16, and 17 related to the spine, the upper extremity, and the lower extremity. And today we're in session five of this program. So today I have a fascinating session for you. We're gonna uh, focus on true positive objective physical examination findings in perhaps the most important aspect of the physical examinations involved in chapters 15, 16, and 17. And that has to do with the physical examination of the neural structures 
So in today's discussion, we're talking about the neurologic exam. So before we get into uh, today's discussion, I'd just like to take a couple minutes to review uh, what we've discussed so far in this program and then uh, pick up uh, today with a discussion about true positive examination findings in the neurologic examination. So let's just take a few minutes and take a brief look uh, at sessions one through four of this program. In session one of this program, we talked about and we defined pain. Now, because you can expect examinees in the qualified medical evaluation to present to the face-to-face -face evaluation in pain, it's important to have uh, a good understanding uh, of what pain actually represents. So according to the Merriam-Webster dictionary, pain is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience. So it's important to uh, recognize and realize that pain has at least two components. It has a sensory component and it also has an emotional component. So as a qualified medical evaluator, it's important that you be able to separate and compartmentalize those aspects of your examinee's descriptions of pain that refer to the sensory aspects of pain and those components or aspects of the examinee's description that are totally and completely emotionally based descriptors. And as a qualified medical evaluator, it's important to be able to focus on the sensory aspect of the examinee's painful description. So that was the first part of the definition of pain. The second part of the definition of pain, equally important, tells us that pain typically leads to evasive action. And it's this evasive action that's gonna form the basis for what we refer to as the true positive physical examination findings, evasive action. True positive physical examination findings are characterized by some form of evasive action. Now in the physical examination, evasive action is nothing more than some manifestation of the flexor withdrawal response. And if you remember the flexor withdrawal response, you'll remember that it's reflexive. It's not cognitive, it's reflexive, it's automatic, and it's a form of evasive action as the examinee attempts to reflexively move away from pain. So in the presence of true pain, when your physical examination maneuvers truly provoke actual bona fide pain, the examinee will demonstrate some form of flexor withdrawal response some form of evasive action in order to get away from pain and that's going to form the basis uh, of our true positive findings on physical examination. In session number two we talked about how different injuries, for example injuries to muscles, injuries to ligaments, injuries to bone, injuries to vascular tissues, each of these different types of injuries have a characteristic and predictable uh, pain pattern and the examinee will use characteristic and predictable descriptors in describing their pain. So it's important that you understand these different types of descriptors and compare the known pain patterns with these various uh, uh, tissue injuries to the examinee's descriptor of their painful symptoms. And it's important that there be consistency between the examinee's description of pain and the known and predictable pain patterns associated with these different tissue injuries. In session two, we also talked about uh, seven types of cumulative trauma or repetitive stress pain. <clears throat> and we also talked about the four different types of pain uh, previously used in the workers' compensation system related to the 1997 permanent disability rating schedule wherein we employed the words of art to describe the subjective factors of disability. And those words of art included uh, minimal pain, slight pain, moderate pain, and severe pain. And each one of those descriptors of pain describes a different impact of the pain on the ability to perform activity. So for example, a minimum pain, minimum pain, minimal pain, is pain that is there, it's a nuisance pain, it's an actual bona fide pain, 
but the pain is not significant or severe enough that it interferes with the activity that causes the pain. So if we're thinking about physical examination maneuvers, when the examinee reports pain during a physical examination maneuver, but that pain does not interfere with their ability to fully complete the physical examination maneuver, in other words, there's no manifestation of evasive action that interferes with the ability to perform the physical examination maneuver, we refer to that as a minimal pain. Now, slight pain, moderate pain, and severe pain describe increasing impact of the pain on the ability to perform activity, whereas slight pain slightly interferes with the ability to perform the activity, moderate pain more significantly interferes with the ability to perform activity, and severe pain precludes the performance of the activity. So with severe pain, the pain is significant enough that the examinee demonstrates evasive action through some form of the flexor withdrawal response and is unable, unable to perform the activity that causes pain. This is important because the AMA guides tell us that an impairment that causes no impact and no functional consequence and no loss of ability to perform activities of daily living qualifies for a 0% permanent impairment rating. <clears throat> Many examinees are being overrated for permanent impairment when in actuality their pain is nothing more than a minimal pain. In video number three, we talked about uh, pain and its relationship to activities of daily living. And we said that pain can interfere with activities of daily living, but most examinees that you're gonna encounter in the California workers' compensation system do not have true limitations to activities of daily living. Now, that does not mean that examinees will not report to you that they have pain with activities of daily living, but pain and limitations with activities of daily living are different things. So examinees who have true and bona fide pain with activities of daily living will generally present to you with minimal pain, meaning that they have pain with climbing stairs, they have pain with walking, they have pain with uh, gripping and grasping and all these different activities of daily living, and yet they're fully able to complete and perform the said activity. So in that sense, the pain is minimal pain only, and the pain, however severe it may be, by their own descriptor, does not truly interfere with activities of daily living. Now for examinees who do have true limitations to activities of daily living, each of the limitations in the activities of daily living that are described in the AMA guides <clears throat> can only be caused by a finite range of conditions and or injuries. And each of the limitations to activities of daily living should be accompanied by positive objective physical examination findings that supports and corroborates the examinee's description of a loss of function for the particular activity. Okay, so very interesting concept. So it raises the necessity of doing a thorough and uh, comprehensive and exhaustive assessment of activities of daily living with each and every examinee. And in my opinion, and it's my recommendation to you, that the assessment of activities of daily living be done in the face-to-face -face evaluation with the examinee. Only in this way, meaning interactively, in the face-to-face -face evaluation, can you discuss with the examinee interactively each of the various activities to arrive at a true determination as to any bona fide limitations with those activities that the examinee may truly have. So it needs to be done interactively in the face-to-face -face evaluation. And in my opinion, this is not something that can be done through the use of a checkbox form. Finally, in our last session on uh, session number four, we talked about uh, objective findings in the observation 
of the examinee. So in beginning the physical examination with your examinee, the first step to any physical examination involves simply observation. And there are many true positive physical examination findings that you can discern and uh, detect simply through observation of the examinee. So we talked about the various forms of pain behaviors that are described in the AMA guides. And we said that uh, with the exception of moaning, crying, and otherwise complaining, most of the pain behaviors are nonverbal forms of communication that you can pick up without even saying a word to the examinee. And you can notice these true positive uh, observational findings when they're present. You can notice these within the first 10 to 15 seconds of observation of your examinee. And then we talked about some of the other true positive uh, observational findings that you may come across with your examinees, such as scoliosis, scars, various asymmetries, limb length discrepancies, uh, and the like that you can pick up simply uh, through laying your eyes carefully uh, and observing the examinee carefully in the face-to-face -face evaluation. So that brings us to today's discussion. And today's discussion, I want to continue with the physical examination beyond the observational examination. And I want to pick up with the neurologic exam. It seems that uh, the neurologic exam is one component of the physical examination that qualified medical evaluators uh, seem to have great misunderstanding uh, about. And many qualified medical evaluators provide for permanent impairment ratings uh, based largely on loss of function of the neural structures, when in all actuality, the function of those neurologic structures is preserved and intact. So in other words, qualified medical evaluators are providing for permanent impairment ratings for subjective findings only on the neurologic exam. So we wanna focus in this session on the nature of true positive objective findings in the neurologic exam. So with regards to chapter 15, uh, the spine, we're gonna be talking about the neurologic exam of the spinal nerve roots. And then in chapter 16 and in chapter 17, we're gonna be talking about the neurologic exam of the named peripheral nerves. And I find also through review of many qualified medical evaluators reports that QMEs are not familiar with the particular anatomy uh, of the neurologic structures. And in particular, they're not familiar with the anatomy of the spinal nerve roots and how those spinal nerve roots then conjoin and coalesce in, into the named peripheral nerves. And they're not familiar with the specific examination procedures for number one, the spinal nerve roots, compared to the specific physical examination procedures for number two, which is the named peripheral nerve. So we'll talk uh, at great length about uh, the distinction between uh, these two different types of structures. For each neurologic structure, for, for example, for the spinal nerve roots or for the named peripheral nerves, we're gonna discuss the anatomy of that structure. We're gonna talk about uh, how injury, how injuries occur to those particular structures. And then we'll talk about the physical examination procedures associated with each of those structures. Okay, so here we have some diagrams uh, of the uh, brachial plexus in the cervical spine, and then also the sacral plexus in the lumbar and sacral spine. And I wanna draw your attention uh, first to the spinal nerve roots. So here we have the spinal nerve roots, uh, C5, C6, C7, C8, and T1, associated with the brachial plexus. And notice how the spinal nerve roots conjoin and coalesce to give us trunks, then divisions, then cords, and then eventually we get out to the branches, which become the named peripheral nerves of the upper extremity, of which we have the axillary nerve, the radial nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, the medial nerve, or the median nerve, and also the ulnar nerve. So 
If we focus uh, simply on the median nerve way out here, we notice that the median nerve contains contributions from C5 nerve root through C6 nerve root through C7 nerve root through C8 nerve root and also through T1 nerve root. So the median nerve contains contributions from each and every of the spinal nerve roots associated with the brachial plexus. So therefore, with an injury to one of those five nerve roots, much of the function of the median nerve can remain preserved because of the contribution of the other multiple nerve roots contributing to the median nerve. So with an injury to C5 nerve root, even if C5 nerve root function was completely abolished, the median nerve still retains function of the C6, C7, C8, and T1 nerve roots. And uh, by physical examination of the median nerve, the median nerve function could appear to be completely, if, if, if only slightly, uh, affected. I, could, I should say it could remain completely unaffected or perhaps only slightly affected by the injury and abolition of function of the C5 nerve root. So nerve root injuries can contribute uh, little in terms of loss of function to the named peripheral nerve. However, injury to the named peripheral nerve will cause much more dramatic loss of function, and this can easily be detected with our physical examination maneuvers. Similarly here with the uh, lumbar and sacral plexus, note that uh, by the time we get to the sciatic nerve, the sciatic nerve contains contributions from many, many nerve roots, including L4, L5, S1, S2, and even in some cases, uh, S3 nerve root. So injury to one of those nerve roots could have little to no impact on the function of the components of the sciatic nerve, meaning the tibial nerve and the uh, peroneal nerve. Whereas a more peripheral injury that directly uh, affects the sciatic nerve itself uh, will cause great loss of function in the areas uh, supplied by the sciatic nerve. Okay, so it's important to remember that when we're dealing with injuries to the spine, we're dealing with neural structures associated with the spinal cord and the spinal nerve roots, whereas with injuries to the upper and lower extremities, we're dealing with the named peripheral nerves, where one named peripheral nerve can be supplied by many, many uh, spinal nerve roots. So a single spinal nerve root can supply also more than one peripheral nerve. So for example, if we look at the contribution of the C5 nerve root, we see that the C5 nerve root contributes to the axillary nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, the radial nerve, and the median nerve. C6 nerve root contributes to the axillary nerve, the musculocutaneous nerve, the radial nerve, and also the median nerve. So an injury to a spinal nerve root may have little to no impact uh, upon the structures innervated by the peripheral nerves that contain contribution from that particular nerve root. And sensory and motor dysfunctions can be found in more than one peripheral nerve distribution with injury to any uh, of the specific spinal nerve roots. So, for example, an injury to the C5 spinal nerve root can involve sensory or motor dysfunction in the axillary nerve, can involve sensory or motor dysfunction in the musculocutaneous nerve, can involve sensory or motor dysfunction in the radial or median nerve. But again, because of the multiple nerve root contributions to each of these named peripheral nerves, uh, that sensory or motor dysfunction may be more or less profound and may be even uh, undetectable. So the symptoms of nerve root and peripheral nerve uh, dysfunction are the same, but the signs and especially the distribution uh, of those dysfunctions are different. And this is an important distinction to remember when it comes to uh, your physical examination uh, procedures and especially 
your reporting of your findings of your examination procedures in your spine section of your report and in your upper and lower extremity sections of your report. So let's begin with the spinal nerve roots and uh, review a little bit of the basic anatomy uh, of the spinal nerve roots, which will give us an understanding uh, as to what happens with uh, injury and what type of symptoms we can expect with injury to the spinal nerve roots. So recall from your anatomy 101 that there's 31 pairs of spinal nerve roots, eight cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and one coccygeal spinal nerve root. And the naming of the spinal nerve roots uh, has a subtle nuance uh, in the cervical spine compared to the remainder of the spine. In the cervical spine, the spinal nerve roots are named for the vertebra below the spinal nerve root. So the C1 spinal nerve root is named for the C1 vertebra, which is below the spinal nerve root. So the C1 nerve root comes out between the occiput and the C1 vertebra and is named for the vertebra below, which is the C1 vertebra. So the C2 spinal nerve root comes out between C1 and C2 vertebra and is named for the C2 vertebra, which is the vertebra below. Now this naming convention changes in the thoracic and lumbar spine where the spinal nerve root is named for the vertebra above the spinal nerve root. So for example, in the lumbar spine, the L4 spinal nerve root comes out between the L4 and L5 vertebra and is named for the L4 vertebra, which is the vertebra above the spinal nerve root. So with the exception of the cervical spine, the spinal nerve roots in the remainder of the spine are named for the vertebra below the uh, below the vertebra through which the spinal nerve root emerges. Now each of the spinal nerve roots is comprised of an anterior and a dorsal primary ramus. So the dorsal primary ramus contains uh, incoming sensory neurons from both somatic and visceral structures. And the anterior primary, primary ramus contains exiting or outgoing neurons uh, consisting of somatic motor neurons and also visceral motor neurons. So if we look at this diagram here of the spinal cord and spinal nerve roots, we see here uh, the dorsal root, which brings in uh, somatic sensory neurons, which synapse uh, on interneurons in the dorsal aspect of the spinal cord. It brings in visceral sensory neurons from structures such as internal viscera, from joint mechanoreceptors, from muscle spindles, from Golgi tendon organs, and those synapse on visceral somatic, uh, I'm sorry, visceral sensory interneurons. And then the anterior primary ramus contains uh, motor neurons uh, projecting out to somatic uh, muscular structures and also to visceral muscular structures such as smooth muscles in arteries, uh, smooth muscles uh, in the viscera. And notice here that in this diagram, the motor neurons associated with the visceral structures are contained in their own unique and distinct area known as the intermediolateral cell column. So this intermediolateral cell column uh, is found in the thoracolumbar spinal region consisting of sympathetic uh, motor neurons and also found in the cranial and sacral regions of the spinal cord uh, associated with the parasympathetic uh, component of the autonomic nervous system. So commonly associated with injury to the spine is injury to the spinal nerve roots. And because of their anatomy and because of their location, spinal nerve roots are susceptible to a variety of different injurious uh, forces. 
So for example, spinal nerve roots are susceptible to compressive forces, such as with a disc herniation. They're susceptible to tensile deformation, such as with a stretch injury, uh, such as stingers or burners that we associate uh, with football or contact sport injuries. They're susceptible to chemical irritants, and they're also susceptible to metabolic abnormalities. So in the presence of a spinal nerve root injury and with pressure on a spinal nerve root, we're going to find physical examination findings such as loss of muscle tone and loss of muscle mass. But again, because muscles uh, receive contributions from multiple spinal nerve roots, we're not going to see as much loss of muscle tone and or muscle mass as we would expect with uh, the same type of an injury, either compressive or tensile injury, to a named peripheral nerve, okay? In fact, we may uh, find that uh, there is very little or almost no detectable loss of muscle tone and no detectable loss of muscle mass because of the multiple nerve root innervations uh, contributing to each of these upper extremity muscles. And the pattern of weakness due to pressure on a nerve root, as we said, is different from the pressure on a named peripheral nerve. Now, in the workers' compensation system with injuries to the spine, we're going to see two distinct patterns uh, of injury to neural structures. The first involves injury to the central spinal cord itself, and we refer to this type of a condition as a myelopathy. So with myelopathy, this involves injury to the spinal cord, and it's the spinal cord that contains the upper motor neuron lesions, whereas the lower motor neuron lesions uh, are associated with injury to the spinal nerve roots. So with a myelopathy, we're going to have injury to the upper motor neurons, and this is going to uh, oftentimes affect both the upper and the lower limbs when the injury is uh, above or contained within the cervical spine, or it may involve only the lower limbs if the injury is below the cervical spine. So that's with myelopathy, and we'll talk more about myelopathy here in a minute. With injury to the spinal nerve roots, we refer to this as a radicular injury or the type of pain is associated with what's referred to as a radicular or a radiating pain. This is typically a sharp shooting pain. It's felt in the distribution of a dermatome, a myotome, or a sclerotome, and it's due to direct involvement or damage to a spinal nerve root. And in the AMA guides, we typically see the word radiculopathy, which refers to the sensory aspect uh, of injury to the spinal nerve root, including pain, paresthesia, numbness, tingling, and other dysthesia, and also uh, involves a component of motor injury as well, which will be manifest as loss of muscle tone and or loss of muscle strength manifest as muscle weakness. So here we have the spinal nerve root charts from the AMA guides. And uh, notice that the C5 spinal nerve root is named for the vertebra below uh, where that spinal nerve root uh, emerges from the spine. So the C5 spinal nerve root comes out between the C4 and C5 vertebra. It's named for the vertebra below, which is the C5 vertebra. And the C5 uh, spinal nerve root we associate most strongly with muscle function of the deltoid muscle and the biceps muscle, meaning that even though the deltoid and the biceps muscles contain contributions from other spinal nerve roots in addition to the C5 spinal nerve root, they contain a large percentage of contribution. The preponderance of the contribution comes from the C5 spinal nerve root and so therefore, with injury to the C5 spinal nerve root, the muscles most likely to demonstrate weakness and loss of function would be the deltoid and the biceps muscles. Now, typically we use the deltoid muscle for testing of the C5 
spinal nerve root and the biceps for testing of the C6 spinal nerve root. So for C5, think deltoid and think sensory area also in the deltoid muscular region. So that would be the anterolateral shoulder uh, and the antero anterolateral upper arm. So that's the area that you're going to want to test for sensory function of the C5 nerve root. And then also to test for uh, function of the C5 nerve root, we employ the biceps reflex at the elbow. So not all of the spinal nerve roots are going to have an associated reflex, but for the C5 spinal nerve root, we associate the biceps uh, reflex with that nerve root. Now, I particularly like reflex testing of all these three different types of testing that we employ to test the C5 nerve root, meaning muscle testing, sensory testing, and reflex testing. I prefer reflex testing as the true positive physical examination finding. So for example, what does it tell you about the function of the C5 nerve root when an examinee uh, prevents or provides uh, weakness to deltoid muscle testing and subjective loss of sensation over the anterolateral shoulder and upper arm, and yet the biceps reflex remains brisk and completely intact and normal. A brisk and intact and normal biceps reflex indicates preserved and intact function of the C5 spinal nerve root, and that comprises the true positive objective physical examination finding, whereas the findings on manual muscle testing and the findings on sensory testing could be largely subjective. So when performing your neurologic examination, it's important to properly perform and to pay particular attention to the findings of reflex testing as the true positive physical examination finding for that particular spinal nerve root. For C6, we use the brachioradialis or the uh, pronator teres reflex. For the C7 spinal nerve root, we uh, employ the triceps reflex. We don't have a reflex for the C8 or the, C or the T1 uh, spinal nerve roots, so our physical examination for those nerve roots is limited to uh, muscle testing of finger flexors for C8. For the palmar adductors and dorsal abductors uh, of the hand muscles. And then for C8, the sensory area involves the medial forearm and the hand and the ring and the pinky finger. Whereas for the T1 nerve root, the sensory area involves the medial forearm. And remember, when we talk about the medial forearm, we're talking about the medial forearm when the hand is held in the anatomic position, which is with the hands down to the side, palms facing forward. So the medial forearm is that area of the forearm closest to the body. So those are the cervical spine nerve roots. For the lumbar spine, we associate the knee reflex with testing of the L4 spinal nerve root. The manual muscle test involves testing of the quadriceps muscle groups, which may be difficult to test uh, by way of manual muscle testing. Perhaps a, a more efficacious uh, procedure to test the L4 nerve root would involve the repetitive squat maneuver, wherein the examinee employs his own body weight uh, to provide resistance against the quadricep muscles which is something that cannot be adequately attested uh, simply through the examiner uh, applying pressure to the quadricep muscles, which would quickly overwhelm the strength of the examiner. So better to uh, employ the repetitive squat maneuver for an assessment of the quadriceps muscle strength. The sensory area for the L4 nerve root involves the anter anterolateral thigh, the anterior knee, and then also down the medial aspect of the leg and the medial aspect of the foot. As the L4 spinal nerve root continues down in the medial leg and foot through its distribution in the saphenous nerve. 
For the L5 spinal nerve root, uh, the AMA uh, guides describe the medial hamstrings uh, as the uh, associated reflex. There's also uh, a reflex uh, associated with the lateral hamstrings, which is also an L5 uh, reflex, but uh, not many examiners test either the medial or the lateral hamstrings for reflexes. But if you uh, become accustomed and practice, you should be able to elicit uh, reflexes at both the medial and the lateral hamstrings, both of which are mediated by the spinal nerve root, the L5 spinal nerve root. Although an important distinction between the two is that for the medial hamstrings, the L5 spinal nerve root uh, is conveyed in the tibial nerve, whereas for the lateral hamstrings, the L5 spinal nerve root is conveyed in the common peroneal nerve. So in the context of a peripheral nerve injury, say to the common peroneal nerve, the lateral hamstring reflex will remain intact, where no, will, will be abolished or will be reduced, whereas the medial hamstring reflex will be preserved. And vice versa, with a peripheral nerve injury to the tibial nerve, the medial hamstring reflex may be diminished or even absent, whereas the lateral hamstring reflex uh, would be normal, even though both reflexes are mediated by the L5 spinal nerve root. So that's an interesting uh, clinical distinction between the medial and lateral hamstring reflexes. So I encourage you to become familiar and competent uh, in eliciting both the medial and lateral hamstring reflexes. For the S1 spinal nerve root, we associate uh, the ankle or the uh, Achilles reflex as the true positive physical examination finding for function of the S1 spinal nerve root. For manual muscle testing, uh, we employ the ankle plantar flexors, which are the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscles. And these are assessed in physical examination by having the examinee do the repetitive rising up and lowering on the toes. The sensory area for the S1 nerve root includes the posterior leg and the lateral foot. But again, remember that uh, motor testing and sensory testing are largely subjective and uh, fail to provide true positive physical examination findings, whereas the ankle reflex because it's independent of examinee subjectivity, provides us with the true positive physical examination findings. So as an example, what would it mean to you if when testing the S1 spinal nerve root, your examinee reports complete anesthesia, complete loss of sensation in the posterior leg and in the lateral foot, which is the dermatome that we associate with the S1 nerve root, what would it mean to you to uh, have a brisk and intact ankle reflex? In other words, the ankle reflex is completely normal even when and even though the examinee reports complete anesthesia, complete sensory loss in the posterior leg and lateral foot. Well, an intact and normal reflex involves a sensory loop, as you know, if you remember, those diagrams from neurophysiology that uh, depict the typical muscle stretch reflex, reflex arc, recall that there's a sensory loop that brings incoming information from the Achilles tendon up into the dorsal root and into the spinal cord. And then there's a motor efferent output signal to the ankle plantar flexors, such as the gastrocnemius, that causes the ankle jerk portion of the ankle reflex. So in the presence of a normal Achilles or ankle reflex, it tells you that both the sensory loop is intact, the spinal cord where the interneuron uh, synapses uh, are present, though that structure is intact, the efferent motor neuron uh, loop is intact and so in the presence of normal ankle reflexes the entire reflex arc sensory spinal cord and motor is intact 
even though the examinee reports subjectively complete anesthesia uh, in the dermatome associated with the S1 nerve root. So thus the importance, and I emphasize the importance of reflex testing as the true positive physical examination finding for uh, the spinal nerve roots. Thank you.